Today, we are being led in our walk by a great friend of mine, uh, Peter Slowick, who is the viola professor from Oberlin College and Music Conservatory in Oberlin, Ohio. Uh, he is a distinguished teacher, lecturer, leader, performer, has played in major symphonies with all the great artists of our time. Uh, he's also the artistic director and imaginer of Credo Music Festival, which is a summer festival in the summer for very serious uh, young chamber musicians who come to Oberlin to study with him and learn. He also happens to be my daughter's boss. Uh, who is the artistic uh, ambassador and outreach coordinator for the Credo Festivals in these years and has been with the music department for the last day or so helping coach and teach. He's also a wonderful Christian brother who shines light in uh, a rather secular place uh, in the world and has a unique way of thinking about that. He's going to share with us today about one of the most common expressions of our faith, perhaps in a new and fresh way, as he discusses uh, working through the Lord's Prayer. It's my delight to bring Peter to all of you today. Peter. Great. I am a violist, and violists are known to do things like this, so please forgive me. Um, so my day started out in a very, very beautiful way. I went for a walk on the beach, and I got to see the sunrise, and there was a gentleman that was there with his dog, and we just got to the beach at the right time. The sun was about to come up over the cliffs, and uh, there was a man standing there, and he was just looking at the sun. And it was an older gentleman. Um, you could use that term with me, but I'm using it about somebody else, so he was even older still. And uh, he, maybe this looked like something he did every day that he would welcome his day, and I just watched this person observing that moment, and instantly I was filled with gratitude for the new day and the fact that God gave me this day, and he put me here to um, experience whatever he wants me to experience today. So um, I hope you have uh, moments like that, maybe not at seven o'clock on the beach. <laughs> but uh, on your campus, there are beautiful places in nature to experience God. And I hope that you uh, take some time to really thank the Lord for um, the opportunities of each day. So I'm, I'm really happy to be here with you. I uh, make this almost an annual pilgrimage. It's really fun, not only for walks on the beach, but to uh, work with the music students here and to fellowship with Michael and some of my other friends here. Um, the first time I was here, I, I talked about my job as a professional listener. That's what I do. I listen to things. And I think that we all can learn about listening to God. Second time I was here, I talked about uh, musical form. And uh, these things are very, very close to my comfort level, and I think that's, that's very good. Today I'm going to go outside of my uh, comfort level a little bit and uh, talk about prayer. I'm not a pastor. I'm not a theologian. I'm your crazy uncle, okay? And uh, sometimes crazy uncles say wise things, so we'll see what happens. But I, uh, I'm going to start with, with a prayer today and uh, see if you recognize this prayer as it comes up. Um, I'll read it to you. And don't worry, things will get better after this. Um, but, oh, breathing life, your name shines everywhere. Your kingdom come into new spaces today as we make known your mystery, posting by posting, blog by blog. With the bread we need for today, feed us. Let forgiveness flow like a river between us, from each one to each one. Subdue our selfish desires to possess and to dominate and for. Bid us arrogance in victory. You're in charge. You can do anything you want. You're a blaze in beauty. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. It's not the way I pray. Um, if you recognize that prayer as the Lord's Prayer, you get a gold star. <laughs> that was a compilation of six different uh, versions of perhaps the most famous prayer in the Christian tradition. I had fun kind of putting that together from... Uh, 40 or 50 different versions of the Lord's Prayer that I looked at in preparation for today. Show of hands, how many of you say the Lord's Prayer on a somewhat regular basis where you worship? Some. Okay, good, not too many. Don't show your hands. How many of you say the Lord's Prayer or parts of it on a regular basis in your daily life? Don't show hands, just think about that. Okay, so... Um, 
if you have said the Lord Prayer, um, maybe you learned it a slightly different way from your neighbor and stuff like that. So um, we're going to say the Lord's Prayer together now to start our time together. And uh, the staff said, do you have it on a slide that we could all say it together? And I said, no, because that's the kind of teacher I am. I want to take you out of your comfort level and I want us to try it. So in the way that you're comfortable saying the Lord's Prayer, let's give it a try. <laughs> our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, on earth as it is in heaven. And lead us not. All right, that may have felt very comfortable to some of you, and it may stretch others of you outside of your, your comfort range. And then we had all those S's that were going on together at the same time. What was all that about? Um, but I don't think in today's society we have much of a call to repeat corporate prayers as much as past generations did. And I come from a faith tradition where prayers like the Lord's Prayer were repeated many times. And I'd like to think about where that tradition came from and why it might be good. Um, in the Middle Ages, relatively few people were educated and literate. Uh, like we all he are here, our college educated folks. Um, so the importance of litany and repetition was really ascendant. God in the Middle Ages was, was held at a distance. Um, he wasn't a friend and guide, but he was somebody to be feared and revered. So repetition of prayers was a way to enhance the mystery of God. You could not use your own words talking to God. You had to repeat words that you knew. So by repeating prayers many times, people could immerse themselves in an almost meditative state where the prayers took on new meaning each time they were repeated. And of course, pe since people couldn't read, they couldn't read a new prayer each day. Of course, this good practice could lead to abuse too. When I was a child, I had to do penance for my sins. I rumbled through my five fathers and three Hail Marys as fast as I could. A repetition of the prayers did not help me in any way. Today, in our sophisticated modern society, with so much emphasis on individualism, um, it's not fa fashionable to repeat prayers anymore. We're taught to open our hearts to God and communicate directly with our own words and thoughts. I think this is largely beneficial. It's good. We should be as direct and open as possible in our relationship with God. But what does Jesus teach us how to, how to pray? Well, in Matthew 6, he gives us the answer. God is more interested in our hearts when we pray than he is in our words. And that's reassuring to me. I sometimes stumble with the right words. Ask my wife. Um, I pour my heart out to her and she usually hears me. Sometimes she hears something else, which is fine. And then we clarify that. So, um, so Matthew 6.6 6 says, When you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. He then tells us, Jesus tells us that our Father knows what we need before we ask him. And then finally, in verse 9, 6, 9, Matthew 6, 9, he teaches us how to pray. And he gives us the beautiful Lord's Prayer that we all said together. So much is packed into a little tight space there. And uh, we have several reactions, could have several reactions to this prayer. We could pray it exactly as it's given. We could pray it and expand its meaning in our hearts. Or we could use it as a model for how to pray. And so my purpose in bringing up the Lord's Prayer is to suggest that you could do all three. Maybe not at the same time, but you could sometimes use it one way, sometimes you use it another way. Um, maybe because of my upbringing, I feel it very meaningful to pray the Lord's Prayer exactly as given. Okay. These days, we have a very, very personal media consumption. And uh, when I was growing up, we used to call it broadcasting. National Broadcasting Network, whatever. Um, and people would listen to the same thing, um, watch the same shows. These days, I would call it narrowcasting. We can choose what news to see, what uh, sports to see, what 
uh, devotionals to pay attention to. So we all have something different coming into our hearts. And so when we all pursue, pursue our own truth and news, I think it's powerful and important for us to search out common threads and experiences to bind us together, particularly in something so vital and important as our Christian faith. So um, for that reason, I think that um, all of us reflecting on the Lord's Prayer, which was, after all, the model that, that Jesus gave us, can be a real powerful way to bind ourselves together. Of course, the problem with praying this prayer exactly as given is what constitutes the prayer is open to debate. Maybe the biggest example of that is the fact that the last two lines, for thine is the kingdom, the power, etc., aren't from Scripture at all, but were added later by well-meaning churchmen who felt that the ending talking about sin didn't tell the whole story. And from the research I did, um, smarter people can maybe correct me on this, but uh, most scholars agree that Jesus didn't even say those words, um, let alone at that time, those specific words at that time with the prayer. And then we all stumbled into the trespasses, debtors kind of thing, right? There's different traditions of doing that. And it's kind of ironic that this prayer, which is supposed to bind us all together, when you get with a group of people saying it, you say, oh my goodness, what are they going to say? Am I going to say the wrong thing? And you just kind of mumble a little bit there, right? Um, and then just within the last year, I don't know if you've followed this, but the Pope has suggested tweaking the words referencing leading us into temptation because he feels that God does not lead us in temptation. God is with us when we're led into temptation. So um, that's an interesting debate that's going to be uh, played out within the Catholic Church if they're going to change how they use the prayer. So there's no way of praying this prayer exactly as given. That's reassuring. <laughs> I still feel that despite these problems, it's good to have a common way and verbiage to pray to God. So I like the corporate use of the Lord's Prayer to me, when I'm in a group of people and we begin to pray it with fellow believers, I always feel like I'm putting on a warm, cozy sweater, you know? Feels good. A second way that we could pray is to pray it and expand its meaning in our hearts. And this is one that I do, you know, I said you could use this prayer in your daily life. When I pray the Lord's Prayer in my daily life, I don't always go top to bottom but I might just kind of scan and then one phrase leaps out to me when I need it. So um, this is a topic I was going to do some serious research on and get you some learned theological people. And yeah, I got a little bit lost in that because remember, I'm your crazy uncle, okay? So I strongly suggest that you do that kind of research. Um, it's, it's a really fun way to get inspired and to have your understanding uh, made deeper. Um, it's wonderful to have a good theological grounding for our understanding. Here's one example that I'll share with you. The phrase, your kingdom come, according to the authorities that I researched, means that we, are welcome, we welcome his authority and depend on him entirely, as his will is good, pleasing, and perfect. Romans 12, 1 to 2. I couldn't disagree with any of that, and it seemed so perfect and obvious that I thought I'd go a different way. <laughs> um, so I think it's, it's valid to explain how the prayer works in our own hearts. And so here are what some of the key phrases of the prayer mean to me. I hope that some of these might speak to you. And if God speaks to you differently through the Lord's Prayer, I would love to hear after chapel how some of the phrases uh, uh, speak to you. That means that you're not falling asleep, that you're paying attention. And uh, I'd love to hear and be enriched by your understanding of the Lord's Prayer. So, the prayer starts, Our Father. This speaks to me because I'm a father. It's probably the best thing I've done in my life. You know, Dr. Schatzberger says I've done these things in my career, but being a father and having four sons who are good fathers and husbands, I think is the thing that I can be most happy about. And... When my family was younger, my favorite part of uh, family life was the fact that people depended on me. Um, I was the main breadwinner in our house, and I was responsible for spearheading the most important decisions. But above all, it was my job to make sure the family was safe. 
And when we were, my kids were little, we used to go all around the country to different music festivals. And we started at 2 a.m. because that's when you do it if you have babies. You know, they sleep from 2 to 5 or some, 2 to 7 rather. 2 to 5 would be bad. But 2 to 7, they sleep and then you're, you know, 300 miles down the road already before the day starts. So I would start in the middle of the night and I would be taking care of my family. Everything that mattered to me in the world was right in the car with me. And it was my responsibility to stay awake, to look for wrong way drivers, to make sure I follow the road signs because we didn't have GPS back then. Um, so it was all dependent on me. And I loved that responsibility. It made me feel really good. So when I think of father, I think of somebody who is taking care of us. Our father who art in heaven. Okay, so when I hear who art in heaven, I think, and everywhere else too, right? He's not just in heaven, he's here among us and between us. Hallowed be thy name. When I hear hallowed be thy name, I think that I should be in an intimate relationship with God, but also I should respect him as the ultimate power of the universe. And that's a really, really amazing dynamic to be so completely under somebody, and also so um, intimate with him. Your kingdom come. I feel that the way God set up things, so much better than anything anybody else could imagine, is, is just really, really beautiful. The way nature works together, the way relationships work, work together, the way it works when we put God first in our lives. God's plans are really fantastic. Your kingdom come. Wouldn't it be great if God's kingdom was always uh, ascendant? Your will be done. I've learned by the time I'm as old as I am that no matter what I want, everything is going to go according to plan. Not my plan, God's plan. And uh, God, I just went through a very, very interesting period of my life that had a lot of challenges. I had expected a series of events with Credo to go a certain way, and they went exactly the opposite. So remarkably, wonderfully, terribly in the opposite direction that I ended up trusting God more and more. When I was your age, I would read the scriptures and people, you know, terrible stuff would happen to people and they would end up praising God. And I said, those are crazy people. <laughs> those are people, and I, I don't think I'm ever going to be like that. Well, the m older I get and the more experiences I have, the more I do come to trust God and realize that even when my plans are dashed upon the rocks, God's glory is shown. So God's will be done. I don't often understand what's going on in the moment, but I always can trust it on earth as it is in heaven. When I listen to that phrase, I think the more we allow God's will to be guide the earth, the more the earth becomes like heaven, and that's pretty great, right? <laughs> so on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Um, so I love bread. <laughs> I could eat just bread all the time. I'm like Oprah, right? Have you seen that meme? Bread. Okay, somebody's seen it. Good. <laughs> um, Google Oprah bread. I think you'll be, be amused. Um, give us today our daily bread. Bread is the first thing you get when you go to a restaurant. My wife and I went to a nice restaurant a couple days ago on the way down the coast from visiting one son to here. And the meal was okay. We got the dessert and it was spectacular. So everything was fine when we had the right dessert. But God doesn't say we deserve dessert. Doesn't say we, we get dessert. Give us the daily bread. The bread is the thing that's going to nourish us and fill our tummies, okay? So God gives us exactly what we need and gives us exactly that. He gives us powerful basic food that will fuel us for each important task. Forgive us our debts and debtors, or those who trespass against us, okay? At this one, I always choke. I don't know about you. When I pray to God and say, forgive me as I forgive other people, <gasps> whoops, <laughs> whoops. <laughs> Do I really forgive? Do I really want God to forgive me as fully and completely as I forgive others? 
No way. What I mean to say, God, is that I'm overwhelmed by the way you forgive me, and I want to be able to do that in every circumstance in my life. So when we say forgive us our debts and debtors, we can use that as an as a inspiration to do God's bidding more. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. I know that I'm tempted multiple times every day to put other things in place of God's love and beauty. God, when I pray this, I say, please help me to fight off those feelings and develop the discipline to be a better disciple. The discipline to be a better disciple. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. When I pray that, I say it's so reassuring that no matter what happens here on earth, God rules everything. And I always trust that God will guide events to his glory in every situation. That knowledge gives me peace and joy. So I kind of like the fact that they tack that on to the end of the prayer instead of uh, just talking about sin. So those are my personal reactions. They don't have to be anything like yours. They could spur you to some thought. I would love for you to sometime during this week maybe think on this prayer and uh, just see what parts of it God brings up to your head and heart and how you react to that. Okay, the third way we could use the Lord's Prayer is to use it as a model for how to pray. And that's how it's often introduced. It says it's not these words exactly, but it's what you should do. And uh, a pattern. And in the pattern, it's important to see the proper ingredients. And those ingredients are whom to address our prayers to, God the Father, the ruler of the universe. The second important thing is to worship God for who he is, to acknowledge his sovereignty. And then, this is my interpretation of everything after that, to ask for the Lord's guidance to live our lives according to his will. And so those are the three um, ingredients that we could use as a model. So with all the different views on the Lord's Prayer available to us today, and I encourage you to go down a rabbit hole on the internet and just like Google Lord's Prayer meaning and see, find your favorite site and see what it says. Uh, including this one that I offered you today, we should never forget that God, in all his grace, mercy, wisdom, omniscience, and understanding, created us to be exactly who we are. And he alone knows what's in our heart and how best to relate to us. And he wants us to speak to him in either the words or the meaning or the form of the Lord's Prayer. So no matter how you use the Lord's Prayer, whether you say it in a group, you study it, you ruminate on it in, in your own heart, it's good to remember that it's a model of, of how we should communicate with God. And when we do that, we should know and relish that the God of all creation knows our heart and wants to be in relationship with you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together here. We thank you for the fact that you put on my heart to talk about praying to you and uh, gave us the example of the Lord's Prayer to show us how to speak with you. Lord, I pray that um, the time we've spent here thinking on the Lord's Prayer will plant a seed in our heart that will embolden us to be in clear communication with you, to give our love to you and receive your love for us, love and instruction for us. We thank you for this day. Bless each of us here and uh, enriched by spending time with you and your word that we could go out and uh, do the hard work you'd have us do today. In the name of Jesus, amen. If you're